Hey everyone, I'm Clive. Hey, I'm Louis. This is Akush. And today we are going to be talking about the ISO 19650 workflow when it comes to mobilizing and then producing information in a collaborative way. And the focus is on how do we automate the tasks from the original contract requirements? How do we sequence them for clash avoidance rather than clash detection? And how do we simplify the updates to that workflow as we go through? The first episode that we looked at was about templates. So there's a bunch of templates, both in the plan and also in the scope. You'll find things like the AIR, which is the structured data in the scope. You'll find things like the organizational information requirements templates in the plan. Those all combine in that tendering workflow. In episode two, we talked about how you go through the tendering and tender response. Episode three, we talked about contracting, so how you wrap that up into a, a, an e-signature. And we, we're, we're like, okay, we're home, home free, aren't we? We've created a BIM execution plan based on the EIR. It's all to the ISO 19650 workflow. So we're good to go, right? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Typically, we've got a PDF and, uh, you know, we kick things off, right? We just start, start to c collaborate with our teams. Absolutely. So our project expectations, because we've got these great templates and we're able to start on the right foot, is that project execution is flawless. We are able to maneuver all, around all of the obstacles and execute the project in a really, really seamless and, and efficient way. It's a smooth ride. There's zero changes. There's zero questions. Everyone knows exactly what they're doing. So there's, there's no bumps along in that journey. And even we've done so well, there, there is time at the end for tricks, for a little bit of playtime as well, because that project has gone so well. However, we know, and this is the serious part, <laughs> <laughs> is that without all of the training and testing of the plans and preparing for collaboration, does it always go that well? Well, not always. And you know, what could possibly go wrong? In this example, we don't even get off the ground. The project team it has tried so hard, but they, they're really, and a bit of fun here, but in comparison, the amount of hours that they put in to fly those planes around the obstacles and the fun that these guys have um, it is vastly disparate. Yeah, but yeah. There's definitely more teams that have experienced this, especially on the first project. Um, and you know, we met with teams that are still experiencing this, and they're five, ten years in, just trying to get it, get that right. So, testing, pr preparation, collaboration, those are the key points to really get off the runway on, on a project. Absolutely. So, how can we set up a project for success? What are the steps that we need to take? Well, today we're going to talk through those two parts, the mobilization, what we need to do to get our ducks in a row and people trained, and then the collaborative production, the execution side of things. What do we need to do to make sure that that is the most efficient as we, we can make it? We support this workflow inside of Planoly. This is not an advertisement, but we will be sharing, obviously, how those functions support the workflow today. The first part that we've talked a lot about is the project planning and getting to a contract. We're moving more into the project control side. So there are three modules to set up the plan and three modules then to execute. Some parts of those we'll discuss and you can mix and match whatever you're needing on a project as you go through. The parts that we'll look at, the mobilization, being able to use the plan module and having tables and maybe a checklist of things that we need to, to make sure that are done. We have a scope that defines the clear requirements to the ISO 19650. What we're able to do is understand clearly who is responsible for what at what point in time, and then be able to sequence that, understanding when people are going to execute that work, and does that affect my work, and does that sequence, if it's done out of sequence, maybe prevent, maybe uh, produce more work than if we were to sequence it correctly. And then if we are able to sequence it correctly, how do we communicate what's done? What does done look like? And using the status codes or using a simple Kanban with the status codes, we can then update everyone. So this is the workflow that we'll look at today. Let's first start with the project mobilization and all of this planning and preparation work. It's, it's a lot of fun, isn't it? This is something that we... <laughs> Well, not so much. Not so much. Yeah, I mean, the, this is the, the part where we're preparing. But unfortunately, this is the not so fun, the more boring side. Uh, typically, it's not on project time. It's it's on overhead time. So this is really why things kind of start off on the wrong foot. And if we don't get it right, the implications are that we have the wrong people. Maybe we don't have the right knowledge on the team. Maybe we fill in that role with somebody else, uh, the uh, learning on the job. I love this one with the kids chasing the, the football around, being able to understand who has 
the, the ball at, the, at that point in time and where the other player should be will enhance. And I've seen this firsthand with my kids where there's a team that understands space is your benefit is to your benefit and they run rings around the other team. So while everyone's chasing the ball, obviously there's some strategy to be had. If you don't have that strategy in place, then you can end up looking like this and following um, uh, and the same sort of thing, trying to find information that is maybe difficult to find and wasting time to do that, reinventing the wheel, starting from scratch. All of these problems, all of these implications uh, are plagues in our industry. So we need a superhero. We need something to come in and help us. And we see the ISO 19650 part two, there's a workflow, there are certain clauses and mobilization is a very, very important part of that workflow. There are three key steps that we'll talk about understanding what the resources are, availability, and um, whether they are trained, being able to have a testing plan in place to make sure that technology is ready, and then make sure that everyone is understanding exactly what the methods and procedures and how you're actually going to execute on the project so that everyone can follow the same workload. So let's take a deeper look at these three. The first one is mobilizing resources and understanding who is going to be available from each of these teams and making sure that they are added to the project. In our case, you can also define a logo for the team and images, their profile images. And this is really important. We've seen a massive change when people see their own identity and start to, you're, you're trying to create a culture between a team that doesn't work together every day and being able to log in and see somebody's profile photograph and be able to hit one button to connect directly on the telephone with them. And having people's, the teams, the company's identities is really, really important. And it's going to carry across uh, multiple steps in the workflow. When things are getting assigned to teams, when you're printing out a contact list, so you're automatically doing that just one time in one area. Yeah, and they are managing it for you. One of the right. themes was that it's all about trying to do less and offload that responsibility to the right person. So it's profiles that are managed by the, the user rather than by you and you having to update that for every project. The other part to this is being able to assign the right documents to the right teams and also the right permissions. Do you want this person to just view a certain document or do you want them to be able to edit specific documents? There are controls inside of the plan tab to be able to say, I do want them to see this. I do not want them to see this. And then inside of a plan tab, we have our mobilization plan. And parts of that are about understanding resource availability. How do you kick off your project and what steps you need? And also the team's training need. And those permissions that you've shared now allow them to access and share that information. Who are the available resources? What team members? What are their skill levels? That, that's information that they can provide instead of you or the, the BIM manager on the on the on the team just trying to fill out all this information trying to figure out these questions for all of these teams depending on what what access those team members have they can come in and fill in that information as well so there is that more of that collaboration and let me also just echo what what you said a little bit earlier as well so uh spending some time on it is not always the easiest but um being involved in a lot of projects with a lot of different teams spending enough time on the preparation on the mobilization maybe uh, that's going to differentiate from project success to uh, to project failure uh, maybe yeah it's it's overhead time it's not necessarily a, a project time but you have to make sure it happens for example uh, a picture tells a thousand words that's typically what we are saying but also inside of the application, you would be able to start um, training videos even or, or best practices, record those and share it with the team. So it wouldn't stay a, a static content. It can become a dynamic content. And we don't necessarily have to talk about software trainings, but maybe just best practices, tips and tricks and, and um, process trainings. That's something that you can definitely share with the team in, in, in this um, interface. Absolutely. The next part is being able to know that you've got all the tools in place. And if you've got to procure lots of tools, making sure that people have access to it. There's a really smart feature. It's called Quick Links in the Planoly dashboard. Each project team has lots of different tools, lots of web-based tools with lots of different links and consolidating those for the teams so that they can access all of them in the same place has been really time-saving for those teams. Yes, yeah, some, some teams typically create a bookmark for each app and then have to log in or to a certain project. But with, with the quick links, what you're doing is essentially creating one bookmark, bookmark for Plannerly, which I see very common. And then from here, they access the project that they want and they see the web applications that are related to this project. And, and from one project, it could be on BIM 360, another Dropbox or SharePoint or even Google. Um, so what you're doing here is just consolidating that information and, and 
saving not just your time, but everyone else um, a few minutes every day um, looking for information. We, we had a contractor tell us that subcontractors love working on his project because he does all of that work. And they on di- on other projects, the comparison <laughs> was they, they spend, you know, it's minutes that build up into hours searching for those links that um, are very easy to find inside of his project in Planoly. So that's really cool. The other part is configuring. If you've got great technology and it doesn't work or you've not connected it up, you're not using the best of what it do- what it provides. And making sure that you've done that. Inside of Planoly, we have a verify module that allows you to hook into things like BIM 360. And if you are doing that, you need to allow the application inside of your Autodesk account, going to the app store and applying the add-on so that that connection will work. So there are things like that you just need to make sure are on the checklist and that you are following those plans. Yeah, and uh, what I can see now the screen, uh, the software training. So it doesn't really matter whether you are working in a closed BIM, open BIM, small BIM, big BIM, whatever terms we want to put on them, you want to make sure that it is going to work throughout the entire project. So finding out how you are going to pass information and how the different applications are going to communicate to each other uh, downstream for downstream uses, that's again, pretty critical um, to to spend the time. And especially as as the size grows with the project, um, the more time you want to spend on, on testing the applications and the communication between those. Absolutely. Yep. And then once we have the people in place and the technology in place, we obviously need to talk about the processes as well and making sure that everyone is going to be following those same processes and methods and procedures. So we've got lists and um, ability to have a set of templates that help you to understand what is going to be developed, what's going to be tested, and making sure that everyone understands those processes, agreeing on the breakdown structure and identification. So how are you going to name these containers of information? How are you going to follow this workflow? Are you all going to be using the same classification structure? Let's make sure that you are. And then being able to do that, we, we make it super simple with templates. One of those templates is actually a set of the information management tasks that come from the ISO 19650 standard and being able to have checklists inside of here. For example, this was uh, 5.1, mobilize resources and all of the things that we needed to do and t- to check. Once we've checked them, we can at mention a colleague to communicate that that has now been finished and that is ready for um, verifying potentially by the manager. So we've talked there about mobilization. Some of the things that we need to do in order to get the project started off on the right foot. The next part is the fun part, surely. It's it's creating all of the clashes. (laughs) Let's hope not. So the principle here is unfortunately, or fortunately, our industry is created by a lot of different companies. And that cross-company dynamic is, is sometimes a challenge. When we look at trying to be more collaborative and producing information across companies, there are certain things that we need. One of them is trust. We need really high levels of communication. We need to be able to see that other people are working and there's a lot of transparency between teams. We need timely information. We need to be able to share things when we said that we were going to, and a lot of other things to be able to pull this off. But does that sound like our industry? Do we, do we associate trust and transparency with the design and construction industry? Un- <laughs> Unfortunately, it is difficult because these teams come together for a project and then they disband and go on to another project. And lots of companies have their, their obviously their own um, goals in mind when they work on projects. And it tends to form a low trust environment. Uh, yeah, we see a lot of like that picture, you know, just kind of like, what are you guys doing? What's going on? But, you know, what we what we see is there's a lot of teams out there that just don't even know where to start. They didn't have the proper information. They didn't have the proper training. You know, they weren't involved in those early on meetings. So they're starting off in a way different page than the teams that were involved. And some of those, those guys and girls aren't even involved or were the right people to make those kind of decisions. It's those kind of questions that we should be asking ourselves when we're doing this prep work or creating the BIM execution plans. Who should be involved? What are the right team members for each certain use case when it comes to BIM? So there's a lot of stories out there that we hear, a lot of implications that are coming out of that. Yeah, we, we unfortunately live in this contractual culture and needing to develop these complex plans to solve a cross company collaboration. And the unfortunate nature of our industry is that we tend to then revert back to old ways of working because we've got deadlines to meet and that's how we get paid. Unfortunately, there there are gaps that tend to happen when people rush. There are overlapping scope as well that causes rework and waste. And, uh, and if we've got more than one team working for different purposes on the same project, 
sometimes it can be pretty confusing for uh, some, some parties. So I keep on watching the guys on the right side. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> Very, very funny, but um, not very productive when we're when we're trying to achieve a goal for the project for, for our clients for, for the appointing party. So in steps, collaborative production of information, this concept of how do we collaborate together to create something that's of value for the customer, the customer being either some other task team or somebody else in the supply chain the or another appointed party or the appointing party, all of those teams working together towards the same goal. Unfortunately, that collaboration is really difficult to achieve. And one of the things that in the ISO standards is not really called on too much is to encourage more and more collaboration. In the list here, we've got five points. One, we start with checking that we've got the things that we need before we then go and generate the information. There are two pieces that we will unpack a lot more in these two steps that enable more collaborative thought and agreement between teams, not necessarily needing additional contract, but it as a result, will reduce the rework and reduce the problematic experiences that we saw in that previous slide. Let's take a look at these five and take a, a deeper look into what they can do and how we can make them easier. The first one is, do we have the information that we need? And one of the key pieces is understanding the requirements. Lots of talk about a CDE. What is a CDE? Well, it's one single place to find a specific piece of information. We can have multiple CDEs as long as that information is not, you don't have to put it in multiple places or search in multiple places to try and find it. So having a clear BIM execution planning CDE or some form of requirements tool is really important. So everyone knows where to go to find what they need to do. And we talked about making sure that we've got the right people on the project, but there's a, it's a two-way street. The people that join the project, they need to know, do I have access to the right modules inside of the application? Um, do I have access to the right documents inside of the, right, inside of the application? And is there, are there any gaps in that information? So I need to be responsible for early on sharing if there is information or certain requirements that are missing that I don't know about, that I need to tell the lead appointed party if there's something missing. Yeah, definitely. There's, it's two two parts. It's the sharing of the information, and then there's the teams who need that information or those resources. They need to speak up and not waiting till the last day. You know, making sure that during that preparation time, making sure you you have access to all of that instead of waiting for that deadline, saying I didn't even have access to to that that content to begin with. And then we move to generating the information. And although it's, out, it's very quick to say, this is one of the steps that really we should unpack quite a lot more because there are some things that we can do to make sure that it is produced in the most optimum way and we are being the most efficient. The, the first one is we have workflows, processes and production methods and procedures to follow. And if we can follow those, everyone working in the same way, that's going to pre create efficiencies for us. The example on the right is showing a hierarchy and understanding a system priority structure as the foundational method to avoid clashes. And we can talk more and we'll see more about that. But as we're generating information, we need to know that we're generating only the necessary information. We're not overproducing at the wrong time and being able to define that using the level of information need framework in a simple way that everyone can communicate and understand and make sure that the assignment of that requirement is correct before we go and generate the information is really important. And then we need to understand when we're going to be producing the information. Lots of teams creating lots of different elements in a building or reports or documentation. And in order to be able to know when I should start my task, it's really useful if I can see when other people are working. And this is simplified inside of Planoly because all of the contract requirements you see on a panel on the right hand side that we can just simply drag and drop into the timeline, define the durations and even put dependencies so that we can inform others when we need certain deliverables in order to enhance or improve our work. Yeah, having the right procedures will distribute the work, right? This, this is one example where a system priority structure can help two team members, you know, mechanical and electrical coordinate a clash together. In my experience, Teams waited till that coordination day on Friday, whenever we've met, we, we, whenever that coordination day was, to then have to have someone come in and, and be the referee, so to speak, um, and say, okay, you need to move or you need, it, you need to move, where a system priority structure 
is I can look at a clash myself and see, see, well, according to this, I can make that decision myself as to who, who needs to move and being proactive instead of reactive when it comes to coordination. Yep, absolutely. The, the last one on this slide was about the information requirements being developed in a structured way so that you can export that for more automated validation. And inside of Planoly, you can hit on the export to be able to understand that whole, whole data structure for the tasks, who's responsible, when they should be carried out, uh, what the geometry, the documentation, the information requirements, even which elements in the model they are linked to. So that is really important to be able to then use that information in, in validation workflows as well. But as Louis was talking about there, once you've got the tasks, you know, from the contract, we need to start to sequence them. And being able to run a pull planning session with those cards that are printed out with the images on is a really visual and rich way to communicate what is happening and when it's happening. A lot of teams through lockdown have actually printed these cards and they put them up on their own walls so that they can manage their own tasks. And they're much more, it's a much more tactile and physical way to understand tasks, which is really nice not to have to go to digital checklists all of the time. So there's a balancing act between using digital and then using the in-person and sticky note based approach as well. Once we're creating this information, it's really important to check it, isn't it? Shouldn't we make sure that we are following and actually achieving the original requirements? Well, one of the things that we are able to do because the development of those requirements has been created in the same tool that we're then managing those tasks, we can go through a checklist. We can pick to say what the status of that task is and even using status codes, for example, the S codes that are part of the, uh, the National Annex from the UK, or if you have your own status codes, or if you just work with in progress, ready for review, reviewed, approved, verified, if you're, you're working through those steps, you can define all of those steps inside of Planoly to make that super simple for teams to communicate what's been done. And even with those exports, this is an example of uh, using the export along with actually 3D repo, combining that into Power BI and using Power BI to do a validation on that data. Automating those workflow steps is really important. So having structured data as the starting point is, is incredibly useful. We then need to be able to approve things. And each task is represented by a card in the Kanban board inside of the track page. So when we're going through this workflow, we've communicated the sequence and the durations of these tasks. And then we move into a much more simplified view where we can filter for tasks that are just our own tasks. And instead of being bugged by the manager saying, How, how's it going? What's the progress like? You can simply drag and drop a few of your tasks in no time at all. You have communicated to the teams that need to know what the status is on those tasks. It's and this works internally and with, with external teams. So each team will have, have certain tasks assigned to them. And typically, They'll, they'll have a way to manage their own tasks, filter, and then distribute some, even to specific team members on their own team. So here's where we really enhance collaboration as far as, you know, not having to, as a BIM manager, not having to herd cats, um, you know, to get the progress updates. These are something that they're tracking themselves, and you can come into the, the view and see for yourself what the percentages are for each milestone, for each team, even a specific team member. So that collaboration, uh, someone said that the task just kind of managed themselves. And that's because most of the work was done by the other teams, but hey, they were really happy about that. <laughs> yeah, everyone has a to-do list, or they, they should do. And if their to-do list is different from the collaborative shared to-do list, then unfortunately, there, there is going to be a problem. And if we consolidate that effort, it means less work for them, the task teams, and less work for the manager to collect the information, less work to aggregate the information. There's no emails flying around all of the time. Um, I remember a, a um, team in Hong Kong, um, I think they were working on a, uh, an airport project and he shared that the owner had asked, how's that going? He pulled up his iPad and he could give, based on any split, any type of uh, trade filtered in that view, you could say down to the percentage of what that work was at what stage. So it was answering all the questions that the owner had um, in super rapid time using just an iPad and accessing that Kanban board. The next part that we're going to be talking about when we get into actually model validation, and you'll start to see not just the visualization like this, but also checking, linking, sharing, publishing, as you go through those steps to make sure that the work is ready for whatever that purpose is, whatever the use case is. So that's some in the next webinar. 
So in summary, when you're looking at mobilization and collaborative, collaborative production of information, you need to follow the checklist that you created in the mobilization plan. The mobilization plan is not something that you did just to get the contract. There are some really valuable items that need to be checked in there. Make sure that the right people are on the bus. Make sure that you have those people picked up at each stop along the way and make sure that those teams are not learning the skills on the job because that can be causing delays and it can be causing rework that is unnecessary if they had been trained in the tools and the workflows prior to them starting. Make sure that the software that you use is tested. Don't use it live in production as the first time. Make sure that you're using and running through those workflows and simulating them, making sure that the connections are set up, making sure that everyone is aware of how to access and what their permissions might be. And as you go through that workflow, it's really good to have a, a test run, walk through the procedures, communicate how they should be doing and using. And that's one of the things Louis mentioned, actually, I think Akos said as well, the video-based training inside of Planoly's plan module, being able to see at the right point in time how to do something and best practices on workflow inside of the tool that you're using to collaborate and manage is really powerful. Make yeah, sure you've seen a huge trend with videos, video training inside of that, the, those modules. So definitely been something where teams are bringing in more content from YouTube and just gathering that up for their, their, uh, their teams or just creating those one, two minute videos themselves and uploading it directly there. Yep. And then make sure you tell people if something's missing, if you don't have access to something or you don't have the list of requirements or you don't know how to do something, tell people early. And then the last one, have a quality check, have a process that's in place before you submit. So it's not something that you finish your work and then you throw it over the fence. It's all about knowing what the requirements were from the scope along with the plan that you've contracted for in the e-signature workflow in, in the contract module. And in through scheduling and tracking, scheduling and tracking, you have the ability to go through the checklist and make sure you've met those requirements. So you know your work is always gonna get approved and you'll always get paid. And that's really the task teams that are taking that responsibility rather than the BIM managers or the project managers that are working on the projects to coordinate everybody's work. All of this workflow is simplified inside of Planoly. And we looked at the planning modules a lot in the, former in the previous episodes for planning, scoping, and contracting. We, on the project management and project controls, we are looking at using the scheduling, tracking, and verifying, but you can pick any one of these. And if you want to get started with Planoly, it could just be that you want to create a track page with Kanban board tasks. Go, go for it, that's free. You don't actually have to pay a, a, a dime, a cent, a euro, dollar, pound, yen for that. You can get started today. You can also get started for free inside of the plan module, creating some plan sections and going through the whole scope, the whole um, scoping workflow with a limited scope for free and also contracting and even using the e-signature workflow. So all of that is there and ready available for you to try out. We have a couple of resources. One is the basics course, the Smart Lean BIM basics course to get you started. And there's a link there forward slash demo. And then on the masterclass side, once you are working, you have a, a company plan or you want to trial and then use a masterclass to get trained with your team. That's a four session, 30 minutes to an hour, each one of those spread over a one week, two week period where you're working intensely with one of our training team and they will support you and, and help you get started. So look yeah, many of those can be in different languages as well. So depending on our local partners, we can put you with our local smart lean then partners. Planally.com forward slash quote. You can get a quote for your company as a new customer discount and get that started. The next episode, we'll be talking about the delivery of information. We've already covered the templates, how we go through collaborative tendering and contracting and then collaborative information production. Now let's look at how those information deliveries occur at the right milestone in accordance with the EIR. Hopefully you can join us on the next one to see some, some insights and uh, some exciting things to come in the product. Take care, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Bye for now. Bye. Thank you.